three. And I am going to go ahead. We will not complete this message this evening. All right. Um, just just let you know there was too much too much there and uh, too much need to be said. And uh, it's just I tried to get it all in one and I had to completely go back and rework it because it just was not going to happen in one message. I want it to be worth being here. I don't want it to be. I don't want you to just come in and say, yeah, well, he preached for an hour. What he preached about? I have no idea. It was so fast. I don't know what in the world he's talking about. So we're going to take our time and uh, work through this scripture and work through what I believe that the scripture is telling us and what it parallels as in the Christian life. All right. Nehemiah chapter number 3, we'll be in verse 15 this evening. Verse 15. And if you will, go ahead and stand with me this evening in Nehemiah chapter number 3. And we're just going to read one verse of scripture and we'll get into the thought that uh, I believe the Lord would have for us here concerning this portion of scripture. The Bible says, But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon, the son of Kohaze, the ruler of of part of Mizpah, he built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Siloah by the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. You can be seated there in your seats this evening. Thank you so much for standing as we honor the reading of God's word here this evening. We'll be diving back into this series here in Nehemiah. We've been that we've been in for some time now. We started out uh, rebuilding broken things series several months back, and I hope this series has been a help to you. I hope this series has been a blessing to you as much as it has been for me to study and, and, and preach. But we've been studying on Nehemiah's burden for rebuilding, and we know that Ezra back in the book of Ezra, uh, uh, before we get to the book of Nehemiah, that Ezra had a burden to rebuild there in the city, but his burden was to rebuild the temple there in the city. So as he was doing that, and uh, it, it would have all been for naught if a man hadn't been burdened to rebuild the walls, right? Then the temple would have had no protection. It would have had anything. So Nehemiah had, uh, had a burden to rebuild the walls. We studied that in chapter number one. He got that burden and then we saw the burden come out in his prayers and then we saw the burden come out in his participation. And then we saw the burden just come out to where we're at now in actually looking at these different gates. Here in chapter number three, we've looked at five gates thus far. Do you remember those gates? Who remembers the first gate? The sheep gate. The sheep gate was the first gate that we looked at. That sheep gate stood for salvation, right? Salvation. Uh, everything begins at Calvary in the Christian's life, right? We're looking at these gates as being parallels into the Christian's life and uh, how, how we can uh, relate those uh, to our life. Anybody remember the second gate? The fish gate, the fish gate there is, uh, the fish gate is for evangelism, uh, that we are to be fishers of men and we are to go into the world and, and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature needs a preacher, right? And, uh, we're to be those, we're to be that mouthpiece for God as we go into the world and tell folks. Anybody remember gate number three? It was the oh. old gate. And the old gate stood for the Word of God stood for the Word of God, and we can hold to the truths of the Word of God. And then right after that, there was a long break between this one, the third one, and the fourth one. Kind of shows that God saves us, puts us into telling folks about Him, getting centered in the Word of God, and then all of a sudden, what happens in the Christian life? The valley gate. Amen. We get hit right between the eyes with the valleys of life. And they happen, but God brings us through those and we get to learn more and our lives goes through trials and uh, they get difficult, but we can find God more in those valleys, right? Praise God for the valleys. Amen. So, and then we looked the last two weeks at the Dungate. And the Dungate is where we've been looking at for the past two weeks. Brother Mike Brown, we've talked about getting the junk out of our lives and removing it from our lives that we can be more like him and be more pleasing to the Lord. Tonight I want to talk about this fifth or the sixth gate rather that uh, we're going to look at will be here in verse number 15. It is called the fountain gate. Or you see it there in Scripture as the gate of the fountain. We're going to call it the fountain gate tonight. This fountain gate here I believe is representative of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to prove that to you with Scripture tonight, okay? The fullness of the Holy Spirit. Through this message this evening, I believe that you'll see the same. I believe as we look through the Scriptures, I'm going to have you turning quite a bit in the Scriptures over the next few weeks because we're going to let the Bible preach this message to us. We'll be looking through the Bible and allowing the Bible to speak to us. So this evening, for just a few moments, 
I want to look at being spirit-filled, the fountain gate. The fountain gate being spirit-filled. Would you agree with me this evening that we can be spirit-filled? Would you agree with that? Yes. Would you agree with me tonight that we leak from time to time? Okay. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. As I was studying and preparing this message, I started thinking about uh, a, a, um, a class, if you will, that uh, Pastor Bell had done while we were down there talking about being filled with the Spirit. And um, as I was preparing this, I started thinking about just how important it is to be filled with the Spirit. And how every time I stand to preach, I beg God to fill me with the Spirit. I I, I beg Him to empty me of me and fill me of you. Because I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be heard. If all I'm doing is giving you what Bo thinks, I just need to go home. But if I'm filled with the Spirit, if I'm able to be used of Him. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something tonight. We're going to look at this here in just a few moments, I promise you. But Brother Matt, being filled with the Spirit has been hijacked by charismatics. It's been hijacked, okay? Brother Tom, and what, it, what is left is well-meaning Baptist folk who are scared to death to even mention this doctrine. Scared to death, brother, brother Mike, to even say anything about being filled with the Spirit as to not be labeled charismatic. We're going to look at it this evening. We're going to look at how biblical it is to be filled with the Spirit. I'll get to it in a minute. All right, I'll get to it. I'm trying to get ahead of myself. But here for just a little bit this evening, all right? Being filled with the Spirit. Being Spirit-filled. The fountain gate. Brother Mike, how about you pray for us? Yes, God. Amen. We're going to begin this evening on this topic. And like I said before we prayed, I started to get ahead of myself, but the charismatic movement has scared Baptists to death from even thinking anything about being spirit-filled. It's still a doctrine in the Bible. It's still a doctrine in which we should cover, and it's something that should be preached, and something that we should understand as God's children tonight that is for us. It doesn't matter. Listen, you can can be spirit-filled and still talk to where I can understand you. Amen. You can, that, those things can happen. All right? Don't allow your personal feelings about something such as what others do to keep you from enjoying your Christian life. You can be filled. You can be filled. We can all be filled and still act like we got a little bit of sense, right? You don't have to. Listen, I've been part of it. I've seen folk fall out on the floor. And I've seen them just, I had a friend of mine used to call them jello jigglers. He wasn't Christian. He is actually a pagan, but that's all that he would that's all that he recognized as Christians. I've been part of services before, Brother Tom, where a lady would fall out on the floor and her dress go up over her head. God ain't in that. I don't care how you cut it. God ain't nowhere in that mess that he would cause a lady to be immodest whenever he's on them. That's, that's not of God. I'll tell you who that's of, but I don't believe I need to. Don't let what you've heard negatively affect your worship. That's why the Baptists have lost their shout. That's why Baptists have lost their worship because they're scared to death to be linked in with a group such as what we're talking about. They don't lift a hand in worship because, well, that's what the charismatics do. I don't let out a holy grunt because that's what the charismatics do. I don't do this because that's what the charismatics Listen, the charismatics aren't the one that developed worship. God did. And whenever we start allowing what other folks do dictate our worship, then we are wrong. God desires the worship of us. It's biblical. It's biblical. As with all the gates that we've looked at, we understand the importance of identifying the meaning of each gate. First, this evening, as we look at this gate, as I already told you, I believe this is speaking of being filled, being spirit-filled. There's a few things that I will give you tonight to back that up. By way of introduction, let's look here at verse number 15 in Nehemiah chapter number 3. In Nehemiah chapter number 3, verse number 15, I want you to notice the location. The location of this gate. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon, the son of Kolhazeh, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it 
and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Siloa by the king's garden. Now listen, that pool there of Siloa, that is the same pool in which Jesus healed that man who was blind in John 9. Go ahead and go over to John 9 with me. I believe it's John 9 verse 7 that we'll be looking at. But I'll show you why I believe that this fountain gate is symbolic with being filled with the Holy Spirit. In John chapter number 9, and yes, it is verse number 7. We're going to look at this verse for just a few moments. John chapter number 9, in verse number 7, the Bible says, And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpreted sent. He went his way thereof and washed and came seeing. Notice the spelling here. You will notice here that they're spelled differently. Right? You notice that? Well, one of them is in Hebrew and one of them is in Greek. Right? So they're going to be spelled differently. But geographically, they are talking about the same exact pool right here. Okay? They're referring to the same place. One reason why I see that this gate is synonymous, Brother Mike Brown, with experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit is what happens after he washes this blind man. When he washes that blind man, it's indicative to what happens in the Christian's life when we get saved. Or in the lost person's life and then becomes a Christian when we get saved. What happened there with the pool? He went and washed and his blinded eyes could see. see. What happens to the lost man when he gets saved? We are now opened our eyes. God's opened our eyes to spiritual things, right? So we are able to see uh, spiritually just as this man was there at the pool of Solomon. At the end of verse number 7 tells us, He went therefore and washed and came seeing. We understand this evening that the natural man cannot receive the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. No need to turn there. You probably know it by heart anyway, but just write down the reference if you want to look back at it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can they know them, because why? They are spiritually discerned. They don't know what's going on. Spiritually, they can't see what's going on. The natural man can't see that. It takes the Holy Ghost yep. to come upon you, amen, and dwell within you to open your eyes. Spiritual things seem as foolishness to a natural man. Coming to church, yeah. tithing, worshiping, reading the Bible, praying. They're, the natural man, Miss Cat, thinks y'all have lost your mind. Why in the world would you go somewhere on a Wednesday night after working hard all week or after you're doing what, you know, whatever around the house, cleaning your house, taking care of the house, what in the world would you go up there and sit there for an hour and let some fat dude yell at you? That's crazy. And then you're crazy enough to put money in the box. Y'all have lost it. Y'all are certifiably insane, they think. But they're spiritually discerned. They don't know any different, right? Spiritual things are foolishness to them. I have family members that think it's ridiculous that we go to church as much as we do. They think it's ridiculous that I set my life up around the church calendar. They think that's crazy. How and why would you? What about your family? Come with me. Amen. Come with me. If I wouldn't stay away from work because of it, hello, I ain't staying away from the house of God because of it. Whatever it may be. That's good. A lost man without the Spirit of God cannot understand these things and see them, sees them as foolishness. The blind man could not see until he was washed in this pool right inside of this gate. Look also with me there in John chapter number 9, verse number 7. I want you to see the interpretation of this pool. John 9, 7. He said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation 
sent. Sent. That's by interpretation that pool means sent. The name of the pool interpreted as sent. The reason that this parallels with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the way that it does in this dispensation, the Holy Spirit is the sent one. He is the sent one. If you study throughout Christ as Christ taught, but if just in the book of John, we'll go to about three or four here this evening, just in the book of John alone, there's multiple references to him being the sent one. Go with me to John chapter number 14. John chapter 14. Brother Mike Brown, I just feel like I caught another gear there a minute ago. That's good. I might end up, I might actually end up preaching some tonight. The Bible says in John 14, verse 26, look with me there in verse 26. But the Comforter, who's the Comforter? Which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send. In my name. Now also roll over to John 15. Look in John chapter 15. And then verse 26. He says, but when the Comforter is come, we understand the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So we see that Christ there speaking said, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost from the Father to come to you. Look in John 16, 7. We'll look at one more. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, we said right there before we start to look at those verses, the interpretation of the pool of Siloam means sent. The Holy Ghost is the sent one in this dispensation. So the reason I can tell you tonight that, that, that I believe that the fountain gate is comparable in the filling of the Holy Spirit is because number one, of its location where it's set. Number two is because of its interpretation as to what the name means, and also by its name. Nehemiah 3.15 calls the gate the fountain gate. The fountain gate. The name fountain gives us the idea of an endless flow of water. Isn't that what a fountain would mean to you? Yes. A fountain would mean an endless flow of water. If we were to go over here to... Uh, Machias, we were just over at uh, WA the other night watching a basketball game. Y'all pray for us, we're wicked. That's a joke. I hope y'all think we're wicked for going to watch a basketball game. <laughs> anyway, I guess that one just kind of... We'll leave those alone. All right. So if you have a, a water fountain over there, they have water fountains at the school. If you, I started to use whiting, but I didn't figure they had a water fountain there. They just have a spigot. But if you go over to that water fountain, Brother Mike, y'all know what a water fountain is, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. A bubbler. Okay. I, I thought everybody's looking at me like I cussed. So it's a bubbler. Okay. If you go over and you hold that button, what's going to happen? Water's going to come out. How long will that water come out? Until the town of Machias goes dry, right? And then WA's going to have a fit because their water bill is going to be ridiculous. <laughs> but you're going to hold on to that. So whenever you think of a fountain, that fountain is an endless supply of water. It's an endless flow of water. Go with me to John 7. You're still in John, right? Oh, I took you back to Nehemiah. Go to John 7. Listen, I'm just trying to lay a little bit of groundwork so that when I start preaching this message that y'all won't think I'm just out in left field somewhere. I want to show you the parallels and how everything lines up in the Scriptures together and how we can connect between the fountain gate and the Holy Spirit. In John chapter number 7, and when you find, yourself, find your place there in verse 37, say amen. In the last day... That great day of the feast, Jesus took and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 
He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said right there that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. To whom? Those that believeth on him. Now look in verse 39. Who did he give credit of that to? But this spake he of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is who gives us the fountains of living water that flow from us. When we are walking in fellowship with the Lord and we are being used in the fullness of God and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then those living waters are flowing from us when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. It flows from us in our witness, in telling others of Christ. So long as we are saved, you, we are in, in use of the Lord, then we have a fountain within us provided by the Holy Spirit of God Amen. that will never run dry. Amen. We think the town of Machias will never run dry. No, it would run dry eventually. Eventually. It may take a while, but it eventually. But I have a river that will never run dry. So what do we need to know about being spirit-filled? I want to look at several scriptures this evening, as time permits, that we can get an understanding of being spirit-filled and maybe even lose some of the ideas in which we have that we've clung to concerning this doctrine. I know people that will, Miss Cat, will never, will never worship God because they're worried about what others will say about them. I've heard this. I'm not making this up. I can't do that because what will so-and-so say? I can't lift my hand because I know what somebody else thinks. I don't care what somebody else thinks. That's irrelevant to me. I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do. I'm going to worship I'm going to praise. I'm going to have myself a time. And it's not for me as we'll look at later. It's not for me. See, the reason I'm going to get in trouble. Y'all don't mind, do you? No. Y'all got my back? Praise the Lord. Brother Mike Brown, I don't worship the Lord. Say amen and shout to bring attention to me. I do it for him because he inhabits our praise. Okay? I can't say the same for the charismatic movement and their tongues. You say, well, Pastor, what do you know about it? I know more than you might think I know. A lot of it's done so others will look at how spiritual you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. As we'll look at that's not a sign of being filled with the Spirit. That's not a sign of spirituality. That's equivalent to those Pharisees standing and praying, saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Well, when you're looking at me, looking at me, looking at me, who are you taking your eyes off of? Brother Reggie, it ought to all be about him. Every bit of it. I don't stand up here and preach so that, and send it out over the internet so people will know who I am. That's irrelevant to me. Right. does not matter. I want people to get help. Right. And the only way they're going to get help is by him. Not Pastor Bo. Right. Not Matt Talatovich. <coughs> not Mike Brown. Not Julie Brown. Not Tom Harmon. We, can't, we can help somebody to the extent that we're able to help. But God's got to do it. But you know who we can help if we're not filled? Nobody. We're of no help whatsoever. I've got an illustration, but we probably won't get to it this evening, about being filled that we'll take a look at. But I'm not of any good help to anyone until I'm spirit-filled. Go to Ephesians 5 with me. Go to Ephesians 5. Moving right along. In Ephesians 5, <clears throat> we'll start looking at 
What is being spirit-filled? Answering that question, what does it mean? What does it look like? What are you talking about? I want you to keep your Bibles close, not only tonight, but the next time that we're together. Is I want you to keep it close, because we'll be turning a lot. If uh, we'll understand what it is and the necessity of being filled, then it will increase our desire to be filled. Ephesians 5.18 says this. This is the uh, quintessential um, Sipping Saints verse right here. We're going to debunk that too. Ephesians 5.18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Being Spirit-filled is about making decisions and being obedient to the Word of God. So let me use this scripture here to prove that point. If someone is drunk with wine, if someone has been drinking and someone is intoxicated, that intoxication will, it will dictate their behavior. Would you agree with that? If you've not been around many drunks, I can give you certain proof that it does. It dictates their behavior. When someone gets impaired, it begins to impair one's judgment. The book of Proverbs talks about a man who is drunk with wine. He starts doing things with women that he normally wouldn't. He, 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 would, he would start uh, being real friendly with a woman that he normally wouldn't, whether they're loose, lewd, or maybe they're just ugly. But he just would not normally have been uh, doing those things. But because of the wine, it has his intoxication, has called him to act in a way that he would not. That intox intoxication it caused him to act differently than na his natural self. Um, I, I, I be, had the displeasure, I, I guess you could say, of being around quite a few people drinking. And being around folks who, uh, they, when you first talk to them, they're just fine. No problems whatsoever. They're nice folk. And then before the night's out, they're fighting everybody that moves, right? Not that they're a bad person. It's just that, that alcohol and that, that, um, that intoxication has switched their brain to a different level and switched them to being something that they are not. However, on the other side of that, if the individual is filled with the Spirit, as the verse just said, then our behavior will be different. If we're filled, our behavior will be different. Just as an intoxicated person, that's what he said. He said, and be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's parlaying those two together in the sense that we need to understand that as much as a drunk will change what they are from their natural person, so should the filling of the Holy Spirit change the child of God to no longer be what we were, but be what we are. And that's to walk with God, to be filled. Being Spirit-filled would dictate your attitude, your actions, your behavior, and your decisions. Just as much as being drunk with wine will dictate your attitude, your actions, your behavior, and your decisions. So we can all look at that tonight, and we've been around it, most of us. And we can understand how that changes them. Now let me ask you this. How has the Spirit of God changed us? I'm not talking about what you quit. I'm not talking about what God's removed out of your life. I'm talking about why do we keep going back yeah. to those things that we get victory over and then we bring it back. Brother Matt, we go, oh, God, God delivered me from that and then we bring it right back. I can tell you of stories I've heard from folks, Miss Lisa, that tell me that, well, God gave me victory over that. And it's not a month later, they're back doing it again. I prayed and God brought me forth through that. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Short time, back at it again. Being spirit-filled, plain and simple, is obedience. It's obedience in the Lord. You won't get alone with God and pray for Him to fill you with the Spirit if you're not willing to do business with him. Right. Because I'm going to promise you this, Brother Mike Brown, if we get along with God and say, God, I want you to fill me with your spirit, he's going to start saying, well, I need that. I need that. I need that. How much time you got for me? 
How often do you read your Bible? How much prayer time you got for me? What's more important to you, this, that, or me? God's going to start asking those things of us. But we cannot be truly filled with the Spirit until we are obedient in giving them to Him. You can get filled. But it's going to take us allowing God to change us. Being Spirit-filled has nothing to do with a different language. But what it does have to do with Brother Tom is what leads you. What leads you? Listen, I know a lot of people that claim that they are spirit-filled because of the second working of grace in which I've never found in the Bible to which they received tongues. But you know the problem I have with that? Is I know a lot of folks that have never lost their gift, yet they live contrary to the Scriptures. Well, if you, in order to have those, you must be Spirit-filled, how are you sinning, living contrary to Scriptures, and yet you still keep your tongues? I'm not a real smart man, Brother Mike Brown, but two and two does still add up to four. And that don't add up. That you can still be filled living contrary to the Scriptures. Now, it don't have to be that. It can be things in our lives that we're not willing to give to Him that prevent us from being filled. Being Spirit-filled is what leads you. What leads us? Being drunk with wine will change the way you think. And so with being filled with the Spirit, change the way you think. We are controlled by one of two things. You say, oh no, Pastor, there's more. Nope, there's one of two things that we are controlled by. It's just as much as there's only two genders out there. Yeah. All right? You can't just say, oh, well, this, that, or that. You're led by either the flesh or you're led by the Spirit. Yep. Two things control us, either flesh or Spirit. Now, there's several little sub-categories uh, underneath each one of those. I understand that. But each one will fall under one of those. So either the flesh or the spirit. What controls our lives? Would anyone be willing to say here tonight, and go ahead and lie, and say tonight that they're led by the spirit all the time? Never by the flesh. The flesh never bothers me. Anybody want to lie tonight? <laughs> I didn't think so. I couldn't either. No, the flesh bothers me too. See, people will look at you, and I heard a preacher, it, it, it was so funny. We was getting ready to leave the house, and we was getting ready, and we always listen to preaching before we, before we leave, and we listen to a, a preacher and listen to all his messages and then go find another one, listen to all his messages that they got on there. The message tonight was Dr. Scott Pauley, and the message was flesh versus spirit. I said, Lord, I, you give it to me all day today, man. <laughs> oh, God, I don't, can't take any more. And then he lowered that boom down on me. And truth be known, people think, oh, well, you're a pastor. You've got it under control. Oh, no, 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 no. I wish that was the case. I wish that was the case. See, there's some religions that'll make you think that. There's some denominations that'll think you that the make you think that the preacher or the, the pastor or whomever that he's clean as a hound's tooth and nothing can touch him and you ever need anything that he's always right with God. He's always filled with the Spirit, and that's nothing further from the truth. I have to wake up and deal with this every day. I have to wake up in the morning and deal with Bo every single day. I think uh, it's Lester Roloff that said, every morning I have to wake up and jump in the grave. Yeah. Well, it means I have to wake up and reckon myself dead every single day, right? Christianity is all about submission. Not submission in salvation, but submission to the Spirit. If I want to be profitable to the Lord, I must surrender over any area of my life that does not, Brother Reggie, line up with him. Now, easy preaching, hard living. Don't answer this out loud, but it's something I want you to think about. Every truth that's in God's Word 
that you know. I'm not, not going to hold you accountable for what you don't know. But everyone that you know, do you uphold it 100% of the time? Do you live by it every single day? Oh, the easy stuff we do. Yeah, the stuff that, that we're supposed to, we do. But the other stuff in which we've been challenged with, in which God's challenged our heart with, and stuff that maybe we used to hold true, but well, maybe not so much now. It used to be, well, if it used to be true, Brother Tom, guess what it is today? Still true. But I don't believe any of us would be so naive to think that we don't have some stuff in our life that God said he wants and we've not given it to him. Sure. Oh, we might give it to him for a day. We might give it to him for a week. But Brother Reggie, eventually it works its way back into our lives. You in Galatians 5? No, you're in Ephesians 5, right? Go to Galatians chapter 5. I know I had you somewhere in a 5. <laughs> Having fun tonight? Amen. I believe the Lord's trying to help us. Yeah, I truly do. I believe the Lord's trying to help us. Amen. And when the Lord's trying to help us, I'm having fun. In Galatians 5, you know, we can all be sure that we're spirit-filled. You know, there's scriptures that prove that we're spirit-filled. Just as much as I know tonight that I'm saved, Miss Jessica, just as much as I know without a shadow of a doubt that if, my, I, if I was to fall out dead right here of a heart attack, y'all couldn't revive me. Matter of fact, if I do, don't try to revive me. I'm going home. <laughs> but if I was to fall out right here, I know I'm in heaven. I'm assured of that. You know why? I've got scripture that assures me of that. I can take you to scripture and show you that I am born again. You know, there's scriptures that show that we can be filled with the Spirit. It shows us, Miss Cat, where we are and when we are. Being Spirit filled is the same way. We can know. Isn't it good to know that you can know? It's not something that's held from you. It's nothing that, that it sits back and says, well, you might could have this. Look, don't look behind the man in the curtain. Don't look behind the curtain. Don't worry. No, it's all out in the open. God tells us that we can be spirit-filled. Galatians 5.19 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. I can't be spirit-filled, Brother Mike, if I'm running around on my wife. I can't be spirit-filled if I'm looking at stuff on the internet, I ought not be looking at. Say amen right there. That's just as much. I can't be spirit filled if I'm doing those things. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred. Uh oh. That's one of those secret things right there nobody knows about. But do you think God's going to look the other way when we got hatred in our heart? Oh, absolutely not. We can play and act like we're spirit-filled, but hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders. Y'all do realize murders in the New Testament? We've probably all been guilty of it. New Testament? Old Testament, you actually had to kill somebody. Old Testament, you actually had to be overly friendly with someone else in order to commit adultery. Now it's done in your mind. If you hate a brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. What was one of these? It's hatred, wasn't it? It's hatred. Verse number 21 Envyings, murders, drunkenness. We looked at Ephesians 5 just a little while ago. And, and, and people try to use that as an excuse for you know, a sip and sane or a Christian to drink. And uh, Well, as long as it's in moderation, preacher, I can, I can have me a little something and you know, just a little something to take the edge off. And So what you're telling me tonight is that if you're able to have a little something to take your edge off, the edge off, then the state of Maine 
has a stricter standard than God does? Because God said to not be drunk. Right? How many does it take to get? Well, it takes me about three or four glasses of wine before I get drunk. Do you realize you drink one or two, maybe two glasses of wine? Probably usually just one. And you'll blow enough to be drunk in the eyes of the state of Maine. So don't hand me this garbage that, oh, I can have just one. I can have just a taste. I can do... No, 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 no. God doesn't have lower standards than this liberal state in which we live in. They allow you to have two. Why would God allow you to have four? Anybody else picking up that don't make sense? Revelings and such like, the Bible says in verse 21, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot be filled with the Spirit with these things in your life. It's impossible. These things not only show that you can't be filled with the Spirit, but Brother Mike Brown, a lot of these things, most of these things, all of these things show the attributes of someone who's never even been born again. Now, I'm not saying tonight that if these things line up in your life and you see some of these things that you're lost. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am asking you tonight, if some of these things are in our lives and in our hearts and in us, then why in the world, Brother Matt, do we want to be associated with something that's associated with a lost man? Yeah. Why would a Christian want anything to do with something so easily relatable to a lost man? Now, those things there are what I call the fruit of the flesh. Look in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no, no law. Now, I want you to notice something here in this passage of Scripture. Whether it be the flesh or whether it be the Spirit, everything in those categories tonight can be related to three different categories. Everything within those Scriptures, rather, can be related in three different categories. You ready? You can write these down. Behavior, actions, attitude. Miss Jessica, in every single one of those that we said, whether it be the fruits of the flesh or the fruits of the Spirit, would be those fleshly desires or those desire, desires given to spiritual things, every single one of them can be related to behavior, action, or attitude. I'm going to show you that. Concerning behavior, concerning behavior, the works of the flesh. Now, I'll slow down right here because I know we got several note takers. And the note takers said, Amen. Concerning behavior, the work of the flesh is adultery, idolatry, and drunkenness. Concerning behavior, the fruit of the Spirit is patience and gentleness. So one more time, under concerning behavior, uh, the behavior of these uh, different attributes, if you will, the work of the flesh is adultery, idolatry, and drunkenness. The fruit of the Spirit is patience and gentleness. Now, concerning the action. Concerning action, the work of the flesh. Under action, the work of the flesh is uncleanness, wrath, lasciviousness. Uncleanness, wrath, lasciviousness. 
actions with the work of the Spirit are faith and long-suffering. Sometimes my actions aren't always Spirit-driven. Sometimes, Miss Amy, my actions aren't always in faith. Sometimes my actions aren't always to be long-suffering. So the work of the flesh in action is uncleanness, wrath, and lasciviousness. Work of the Spirit is faith and long-suffering. Now, concerning attitude. Concerning an attitude, the work of the flesh, hatred, strife, and wrath. Work of the flesh with the attitude is hatred. We can show hatred. We show strife. We show wrath from time to time in our flesh. But the work of the Spirit. Concerning our attitude, the work of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Now, concerning behavior... Concerning action and concerning attitude down through there. We saw the works of the flesh, the works of the spirit. And I know I didn't cover them all, but, but in those, Brother Matt, we would all sit here tonight and say, well, concerning behavior, I won't have a fruit of the spirit. Concerning action, I, I want to have a fruit of the spirit. Concerning attitude, I definitely won't fruit of the spirit. Unfortunately, Brother Tom, too many times we have the flesh in our behavior. We have the flesh in our actions. We have the flesh in our attitude. Everything in these verses that deal with the work of the flesh or the spirit is related to our behavior, our actions, and our attitude. Understand this tonight. Being spirit-filled has absolutely nothing and I mean absolutely nothing to do with how long you've been saved or how much scripture you know. I just rained on a lot of people's prayers. Some people just cut me off. They say, yep, he ain't in the spirit. He, that. I've been saved for this many years. I'm filled with the spirit. I know this much scripture. I'm filled with the spirit. Yep. You're humble too. <laughs> but it has absolutely nothing to do with how long you've been saved, nor how much scripture you know. I know people who have been saved a long time and ain't nowhere near as far down the road as others who have been saved just a short amount of time. You see, the reason that it has nothing to do with being spirit-filled is that when you are saved, God begins to show you areas of your life. And when he starts to show you areas of life that he wants, he expects us, Brother Tom, to throw them over his shoulder, take them out the dung gate, Throw them out there into the valley and valley hit them and come on back, right? That's what he expects out of us. Some people do that. And some people won't. Maybe we take them for a time and then they come back into our lives. So really, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. What matters is our obedience to God. What matters is our obedience to what he asks us to do. The Bible says in James chapter number 4, in verse, go ahead and turn there. James 4, 16. We'll finish up right here. I'm, I'm going to tell you something very surprising. I didn't get as far as I thought I would. Surprise. No, but I, I wanted to slow down on purpose to make sure that we, we get a hold of this. In James chapter number 4, in verse number 16. But now ye rejoice in the boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Would you agree with me 100% tonight that if it was right 100 years ago, it's right today? If it was right, if the Bible said it 50 years ago, it says it again today, right? If it was right in the Christian's eyes 
five years ago, it is right today. Maybe not everybody agrees with me on that, but it's true. If it was right, then, if it's ever been right and you stood on it because you had scripture, then it is right tonight. I think of this because I think of people that I know. I think of ladies that once stood a certain way with their wardrobe. And now they won't. I know people who once believed that modesty was a long flowing garment. A catastole is, is told in 1 Timothy. It means a let down garment or dress. Speaking of women. They used to live it. But Brother Matt, now they boast that they don't. What did James say about those boastings? They're evil. See, when you rejoice in your boastings, your such rejoicing is evil. When someone has a boastful attitude about going against things that they know to be true, according to James, it is sin. And how spirit-filled can you be with sin in your life? Brother Reggie, that's a zero. That's right. You cannot be filled with the Spirit with a boastful, arrogant attitude towards sin. When we want things that aren't what the Lord would have for us and not what the Bible tells for us to have, then we are full of flesh and not the Spirit. Our behavior, our actions, and our attitude prove to us and to others where we truly are living at. A major mistake that's been made by people is they mark someone's spirituality by how long they've been saved and their Bible knowledge. Think about Matthew 4. Brother Mike Brown, think Matthew 4, Satan. He's got more knowledge than any of us put together concerning the Scriptures. Anybody, anybody want to guess if he was Spirit-filled? Or was ever able to be? Of course not. He's a master of quoting and misapplying Scripture. False prophets know Scripture. If you want to truly be able to judge someone and yourself be judged by others, by their spirituality, then write this down. I think this will help you. It's not how much of the Scripture that you have mastered. It's how much of the Scripture has mastered you. If we truly, truly want to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now y'all understand that you were given all the Holy Ghost that you was going to get at salvation. That, I didn't feel like I needed to bring that up tonight. We understand that. We're, we all understand. But the filling of the Spirit. I'm going to say a statement tonight and we'll finish up. It breaks my heart to make, guys. It's a bold statement, but I'll make it anyway. I fear that majority of Christians, and yes, I said majority of Christians, Brother Matt, have never felt the fullness of the Spirit since salvation. Why would you, why would you think that, Pastor? Why would you think? Because we're too much in love with ourselves. We're too much in love with me. We're too much in love with, well, that don't make me feel good. Mm. Well, I don't believe God ever asked what made you feel good. Right. <laughs> well, I don't like acting like that, looking like that, talking like that. Well, where does that fall in the equation of Scripture? Yeah. It doesn't. I was talking with, matter of fact, talking with Nicole before we ever left the house tonight. And we were talking about tattoos. We've got plans to go get one. No, I'm picking. <laughs> but we were talking about it. It's a joke. It's a joke. Miss Cat's fixing to get up and walk out. I'm joking. I'm joking. We were talking about them. And I said, yeah, the book of Leviticus talks about not marking your body with a dead person's name and tribute to them. 
well, as long as I get like a rose or as long as I get something for my children or something, then that's quite, that's okay, right? Actually, it's not. Because if I go out here and I paint Brother Mike Brown's house with a big old can of spray paint, guess where I'm going? To jail. Why? It's not my house. This isn't my house. I can't paint it up, dress it up, and do with it like I like because I was bought with a price. Yes. That, that price was paid for on Calvary. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the right to mark it up, paint it up, dress it up any way contrary to the Scriptures. Good Amen. I'm talking about being filled with the Spirit. We want to be filled with the Spirit. Not how much we've mastered. But how much of them have mastered? How much has the scripture mastered us? Being able to quote scripture is a fantastic thing. Praise the Lord for it. But it has little to do with being spirit filled. I know a young man in jail. I know a young man in jail, Brother Reggie. He could quote scripture. I mean, buddy, he had it down. And he was good. he was good. King James. Boom. I said, man, I said, uh, that's where you used to go to church. I ain't never been to church. You know an awful lot of scripture. He said, yep. He said, I've been in jail an awful long time. And he had a bit of a photographic memory. And I thought to myself, I thought, God, I'm not complaining. But why can't I have that? <laughs> yeah, this boy don't want nothing to do with you. He's just learning it to be learning it so he can combat somebody. That's all he wants. Why, why can't I have that? You know why? It'd be too easy for me. It'd be too easy for me and I wouldn't depend on him. I would have the scripture, but the scripture wouldn't master me. Right? Has the Bible gotten from your head to your heart? In the point that it changes your behavior, your actions, and your attitude. Last challenge right here, okay? I know I've said that a hundred times. Miss Cat, how many times? Several. Ask your mate. When you get home tonight, ask your mate if they think you're spirit-filled. Y'all do know we get our best right here, right? Y'all get the pastor's best at church. I mean, Miss Cat tells me Brother Matt's like this all the time, so. But honestly, we get our best here. Would you be confident enough to look at your spouse and say, would you consider me spirit-filled? If I was to get Miss Nicole up here and turn her loose and say, all right, baby, tell them all about me. I'd get my feelings hurt because I don't see my faults like she does. How about asking your kids? Do you think mama's spirit filled? Do you think daddy's spirit filled? Just think about that. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. What would somebody say if we truly asked them? What would somebody say if we asked them at work, out in society, out at the bank, things of that nature? It probably wouldn't be what I want to hear. You're right. Because in my mind, of course I'm spirit-filled. Even when I'm mad, I'm spirit-filled. <laughs> right? But we rarely see the negative in our own lives. Let's finish up right there tonight. I believe that's going to be a, a good stopping point for us. And we'll, we'll get back into it next week. But I want to leave on that challenge right there. If we were to go home this evening, if I felt like just getting my feelings hurt, Brother Mike, and I looked at Miss Nicole as we got ready to go to sleep tonight, and I say, sweetheart, would you consider me to be spirit-filled and be honest? I probably wouldn't sleep much. But here's the great thing of it is, Brother Matt, I don't have to ask her. I can ask God. And the Spirit lives within me. You would find it funny if you lived in a neighborhood with somebody for 10, 20 years and never met them. Wouldn't that be kind of funny? You never met somebody in your own neighborhood? How about if you lived in the same house as somebody for that long and you never knew them? How about if it lived within us and we never truly knew who he was? His bowed eyes closed.